I, I've got a couple of things that I want us to, to look at. You know, when we're talking about discipleship, we're thinking about these traits in the context of, is someone investing in you, and are you investing in someone, the invested life? And, and when we're talking about discipleship, we're talking about this goal of being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. So how can we come alongside someone and, and be a part of this transformation? So in the context of this discipleship relationship, what... This is probably a rhetorical question. I know Dad lots of times asks questions and like wants people to answer. I feel like I run out of time when I do that. So I'm scared. But but you can you can shout it out if you have something that comes to your mind. When you think about this discipleship sort of thing and relationship, what is if you are the discipler, if you are the person who is coming to someone to help them grow into the image and likeness of Jesus, what is the First, the most important, the most central question for you to be asking. It doesn't mean that you necessarily ask this question out loud, but the central guiding question for you as a disciple maker. Does anybody have a thought? It's like, what, what should be like the overarching, the key question? There's lots of questions. We're going to talk about lots of questions tonight. But the key guiding question that really never goes away, it's always there in the background. It's always running in the back of your mind. And it's how we start. It's how we come to this discipleship project. And, and for different people, they think about this different ways. I'm going to propose a right way and some, and some wrong ways. But you can disagree with me. That's okay. Some people come to a discipleship relationship, to this connection with this person, with this question. What does this person need? Seems like a good question. We want to help meet needs in someone's life. So what does the person need? Seems like a logical question. There's a problem with it, though. And another question that we might ask is, what can I do for this person? So more so, it is connected to what this person needs, but more so connected to what do I have? What do I bring to the table? What can I do for this person? which is an aspect of discipleship. You know, we talked about this when we first kicked things off, right? And being one step ahead in the path. So there is some value to this idea of what can I do for this person, but it still falls short. The third question would be this. What, and this, you know, we're about community, Christian community, we're worshiping community. What can we accomplish together in this discipleship relationship? I'm connected with this person. What can we do together? Again, it seems like a great question, but I'll, I want you to think of this question as dictating what is the center of this discipleship relationship, this discipleship paradigm. So the question number one, what does the person need? Who's the center? The person who's being discipled. They're the center. You're starting to see where a problem might be coming in? What do I have to bring to this person? Who's the center of that question? Me. Me. What do I have? What do I bring to the table? So that is not what we want to be the center of things. Then we have what can we accomplish together? Then the relationship is the center of discipleship. Now, relationship is very foundational to discipleship. It's very hard to disciple someone if there is no connection. We're going to dig into that a lot more Sunday. But that is not the center. The center of the relationship is not the relationship. The most important thing in the relationship is not the relationship because the relationship is not an end in and of itself because we're a bit talking about being discipled into the image and likeness of Jesus. So who needs to be the center of the discipleship relationship? So what would be the key question then to guide us towards a God-centered approach to discipleship? Nothing else really makes any sense when you put it like that. You know, <laughs> What else could discipleship be centered around? But yet this does happen. It can become centered around the relationship. It can become centered around a person. It can become centered around a personality. We want a discipleship relationship that is centered around the question, what is God doing? This is what's always running on a constant loop in the back of your mind in every discipleship relationship, in every moment, in every interaction, in every prayer, in every seeking, in every aspect of this. What is God doing? 
This is the overarching. This is what keeps God central in everything in our discipleship. What is God doing? Is this kind of making sense? So, so we're, we're, not, we're not seeking what can we do because he loves to do stuff we can't. We're not seeking what does the person need. Not that either of these are bad things. These may be parts. They may be aspects. But we're not just seeking what does the person need because that's just limited then to what we can see of what they need. We need to see what God sees they need and what God wants to do. In their, we might see a need that they're not ready to have met and we can't meet. Do you see what I'm saying? So being centered around the person, being centered around the relationship, being centered around us, we bring, it's got to be centered around God. God, what are you doing in this relationship? What is going on? We said this statement for years and years. I don't even know where it comes from. Find what God is doing and join him. Who was that? Henry Blackaby, yes, exper- the Experiencing God Bible study from, boy, we did, that, it's really good. Find what God is doing and join him. So when we're embarking into these discipling relationships to, to raise people up, to partner with the work of God in their lives, to help this transformation process take place, we have this tremendous privilege to discern what God is doing and join him, to discern God's work and celebrate that. There's, there's this, this discern and affirm. See, when you're trucking along with Jesus, it can start to get bleak. It can start to get discouraging at times because we may not see God's perspective of his working and his transformative power in our lives. And so sometimes it's such a blessing to have someone come alongside us and see and affirm what God is doing, what God has done, and what God is doing. This is the uh, affirmation and the discernment. An outside set of eyes can bring such a powerful perspective, especially when we're discerning and asking this question, what is God doing? So... What is God doing? What does God want to do? We we broke it down in the beginning of the series into three key areas, and we're really going to sort of expand that tonight. I do like the three areas, and we'll probably stick with that language for Sunday mornings, but there's there's another grid that I wanted to give everybody here tonight. I believe we're going to have time to do it. So we talked about sort of three distinct transformative works of God in three distinct areas. The renewed mind, the surrendered will, and a healed heart. And those are super helpful, and really you can can sort of finagle it and work almost everything we're going to talk about tonight into that, but I'm going to to use a little bit different language to try to expand this a little bit more. So I'm I'm deeply indebted. These these four questions and these five areas we're going to look at tonight was a professor of mine by the name of Dr. Oliver McMahon, and this, this grid, if you will, has been in the back of my mind for ministry for probably 17 or 18 years. And it's just what I'm always going back to in every conversation, in every relationship. This is the grid. This is the framework where I'm trying to find what are you doing, God? And this is what I base it off of is these five areas. The first is the assumptive or the spirit. You know, we're spiritual beings at our most inner, most deep level. So this, this aspect of spirit, and this is connected with our primary assumptions about life. And when I talk about assumptions about life, these aren't really necessarily things that we think about consciously. It's like pre-thought is how some people talk about it. It's like we are just here. We're just assuming this. We're just, this is our, our worldview, our context. This is our, our walk with God most centrally. So this is a really deep aspect, but is absolutely key. Out of this place of spirit, the rest of these aspects should be influenced out of transformation that comes from the deepest parts of who we are, these assumptive aspects of the spirit. Then the emotions. We need healing in our emotions. We need awareness of our emotions. Emotions are really, if we're, if we're stepping beyond those assumptions, those life assumptions, that pre-thought, assumptions would be things as far as what we're conscious of, 
the most powerful aspect in most people's lives, if we're really honest, even most believers, the most powerful aspect in most people's lives as far as dictating what's going on with them is emotions. And in most cases, people have an emotion, and then, of course, number, number, where are we at? Three, number three, the cognition, the thinking, and then think about it and logically come in to build a case for what their emotions told them in the first place, and then they're like, we've made a logical decision. You, you came with a preconceived thought or impulse to any logic. So it's really a confirmation bias story at that point, right? So cognition, thinking, very important aspect. Renew the mind. Four, sorry, I've got these in letter forms. <laughs> I'm going to turn D into four. But behavior, what is the action? This is where the, the will comes in here. It's also connected with the assumptive and the spirit. But the behavior, what is actually happening in someone's life? We've got, I mean, James is so strong here. We've got to look at action at some point in this thing. It, it, it can't be just talk. We've got to get to behavior. And then five is the context. What is the context? What are the situations going on around them? What are the relationships? What are the things? What are the circumstances? What are the family systems? What are the events? What are the development? What's the health? All of these, these are the context in which we live. Now, should we be dictated by that? No, but if we're discipling someone, we need to be aware. They need to be aware. Context is extremely powerful. And we want to be aware. And we, this is the place where the behavior happens. This is the place where they're being funneled into probably different directions, right, is their context. So these five areas are what we're going to try to walk through and look at. If you're discipling someone, what are some practical ways to dig into these areas? And most important, what is God doing? What is God doing? But what happens is each of these areas needs to be given attention to over the course of a discipleship relationship. That doesn't mean every time you get together, you're evaluating all five areas. That's not what I mean at all. Because there may be one time where you're just focused on emotions. That's the whole time that you're meeting with someone, that you're talking with someone in that interaction. And it may even be a season that you're focused on one of these areas. But in the back of your mind, you're always asking the Lord, what is going on? And you're sensitive to, okay, we need to explore something different because all these are interconnected. This, we're, we're integrated beings. So we've got to get into these other areas at some point. <clears throat> so we've got this grid laid out, and we're working through it in our mind, in these conversations and in this discipleship context. <clears throat> But the assumptive is, is truly the aspect where you ask people, and, and I realize this is more true with children probably than adults, but I think it happens with adults too, where you ask people, you know, why? Why did you do this? And what we're really meaning is, what were you thinking? And sometimes people just don't want to tell us, but sometimes I really believe they're honest and they say, I don't know. Some of you have faced this with your children. It's like, why did you do this? Like, I don't know. Sometimes they're telling the truth. They don't know. They don't know. Now, we may be on a journey to help them come to know and discern and learn and grow in that, but they may not be lying. That there is a place where we don't always know why, and we have to do some work and dig. And so what are some keys to this area? that a discipleship relationship, when you're ministering to the deepest parts of a person, it's, it's, it sometimes is words, but don't assume that it's going to be words. Don't assume that it's going to be a conversation. I think so often we think of these discipleship relationships as we're, we're sitting down, and I've, I've been there many times. I'm not, I'm not debating this, but where we sit down and we talk with someone and we, we pray with someone. Maybe, you know, we say some nice words, and we're asking them some questions, and we're reading Scripture, and all these things are valuable. But there's times when we're coming to minister to this area where it's just put on some worship music, or maybe there's not even any sound at all, and you're just laying on the floor waiting on the Lord. Because only He can do things in 
in any transformation. It's all dependent on him. But absolutely most and significantly in this area. This is not an area that we're going to puncture easily apart from the Spirit of God. So we're trying to discern what are the deepest things, what makes this person tick, what makes them do life. And so we need to come and experience the presence of God together. That we come into this worship environment and we're discerning with them the the work of God in their lives. Anything that happens here is divine intervention. We're just privileged to be a part. So we can't get prideful here. Do you see what I'm saying? That's a blessing. This comes to a choice. This comes to a moment, that engagement of the will. Will we yield? We have to yield. We have to respond to God for transformation to occur. And there's that tension of if we don't even know why, then we certainly don't know how to respond. Like, there's a gap here. We know we want to be transformed, but we're not really sure what needs to be transformed. Some deep aspects. And so we want to be looking to the revelation of the person of God. Because things start to fall into, uh, fall into place when we lock eyes with him. That's, that's probably the biggest key for this, this aspect because it is so deep within us. So there's, there's this area of the spirit where we need to encounter the person of God there's the emotions, we need to be healed, we need to experience the presence of God. There's the thinking, right, the renewed mind where we need to encounter and live out of the heart of God. And then there's behavior, we need to come into alignment with the will of God. Okay? Romans 8, 16, for his spirit, this is the spirit, Holy Spirit, joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. This is central, really, to everything that we're going to walk through in these areas, <clears throat> that the Spirit of God is crying out within us that we are God's children. So, just some practical things as we're, we're walking through this one. One, beware, beware, beware. Discipleship is basic. Discipleship is simple. Discipleship makes sense. If you start having a conversation with someone and you're going into the deep places of revelation and encounter and all kinds of crazy, and all of that is needed. I'm not not trying to dismiss that or disregard that. All of that is valuable. But if you start to go into those places and you start to feel like you are completely lost, then don't be afraid to pull a little and pull someone out of what I call the Christianese and pull them into just what happened yesterday. What happened last night? What is God doing? What is he speaking? And, and if they still are off in this, well, I had this amazing, well, 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 then just keep bringing them back. Because it needs to make sense. If you can't understand it, don't assume that they know. But even more significantly, If you can't understand it, don't assume that there's any life transformation happening. Do you see what I'm saying? The the great myth, you're you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. No, That, that is just not how it works. Who was more heavenly minded than Jesus? He was a lot of earthly good. So if we start to feel like we're bumping up against that, then it's time to pull them down to the image and likeness of Jesus. It's got to be practical. It's got to be transformation. It's got to be, it's got to be playing out. It's got to impact all five of these areas. It can't just be here in something that's amazing and transformative that's happening deep within a person and there's no fruit in their choices and in their behavior and in their emotion. Then this is a real problem. And this is where discipleship can just get completely the legs chopped out from under it. Chad and I have had multiple conversations about this where you just you don't under, you, you, you feel just lost. You're, you're, you're trying to minister to someone, and it's just like they're all over the place in this Christianese. And then you come to find out there's not good fruit. There's not good character. And it's because we, now they have a responsibility, but we as disciple makers have not assessed all of these areas, all of this grid. We've let these people stay here where they could talk the talk, but we haven't put them to the wall. Can you walk the walk? So we've got to jump from this area into some of these others 
What's going on in your emotions? What's going on in your thought patterns? What's going on in your behavior? What's going, do you see what I'm saying? So this is what saves us from being, being trapped or letting someone hide in the Christianese. And I'm, I, again, nothing wrong with amazing revelations. You see this in the Bible. These are biblical experiences, intimacy with Jesus, all this. But it's got to translate into day-to-day fruit. Amen? Everybody okay? I feel like I got really excited about that one, and no one else was. But if you encounter it, you will be excited about it, too. It will be helpful to you. So <clears throat> we've got this aspect here of surrendered will that in these deep places of who we are, we are, we are surrendering whatever needs to be surrendered to the will of God. And again, it just, it's important as we're discipling people, sometimes just having this sort of third eye view, having this perspective from outside of their lives, there's certain things out of brief conversations even, but definitely lengthy relationships, where we will see the, the just disparity, the grave inconsistency. Like, this is, this is like a real problem. Like, how are you thinking you're living for Jesus when this is happening in your life, and you're asking people about this stuff, and they're like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm living for Jesus. And they don't see it, and there's these two things that we want to keep in mind because they, it doesn't mean necessarily that they are lying. They may be just lying, but oftentimes there is denial where people are truly in denial and they're so deep in denial that they believe it. They're denying the full impact, the full weight of a decision or something that's happened in their life. Or they're wrapped up very similarly in self-deception. So we want to be patient. We can't, we can't bring these amazing revelations. It has to be, the what is God doing? It has to be in his timing. It has to be aligned with him. It ha- he has to wake people up out of things like that. It's not on us. We're there to ask the questions and to try to discern what God is doing and try to complement that. So I, when I share this, I, just, I want to be sure that it's in this context. Because you could get overwhelmed thinking about, oh, I've got these five areas and I've got to be assessing all these aspects of their lives and all these things. And I, that may feel a little bit overwhelming. Trust me when I say it, it can become very simple and just literally be a grid in the back of your mind. But the, the key thing that I want you to know is that these areas are not your responsibility. You can't bring transformation. Like that's the heavy lifting. And we leave that with him. We're just trying to discern. We're just trying to ask the question. We're just trying to get stuff out there. We're just trying to bring things out of the darkness into the light. But they have to let him come and do a transformative work. We can't make any of that happen. So so as I'm talking about this, please don't feel that the heavy lifting is on you. And please also keep in mind, these, these five areas, this grid, is not just for us to be looking through this lens at people around us that we're trying to minister to. This is also a tool for self-evaluation, right? That we're looking in our own lives, trying to be just as honest and, and bear, as, bear it all as we can and say, God, you know, are these emotions aligning with your Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Is, is my thinking, is my mind being renewed, or am I trapped in this gutter over here? Is this, is this life and light that I know is inside of me because I read your Scriptures and I know the Holy Spirit is in here and He's trying to cry out, Abba, but is He actually crying out, Abba? Is this actually working? Do you see what I'm saying? So it's a tool for us looking at ourselves as well. When we're talking about denying, when we're talking about self-deception, when we're talking about surrender, we're never talking about surrendering to us as a disciple maker. We're never talking about surrendering to our will. It is always the Word of God. We never want people trying to rise to any other bar than the Word of God and the life and ministry of Jesus. So that's what we're challenging. That's the truth. That's what we're challenging people to press into. And what we do this, we ask questions, right? So we're inquiring about simple things like what are, what are your spiritual practices? What are your spiritual disciplines? What is your, your time that you're spending with God? Oh, I'm so close to Jesus. You know, are you, are you, but, but, but are you praying every day? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm praying over my food. It's about five seconds long because I'm really hungry usually. Like, what, what is really happening when you really pray? Oh, yeah, I'm reading the Word. Are you reading the verse of the day? Are you reading a chapter? Are you reading a book of the Bible? Like, what's, what's really going on in these areas? These are key disciplines, key practices that will bring transformation when they're properly pursued. But, but is this happening? Oh, yeah, I'm pursuing Jesus. I'm praying. I'm reading the Bible. But you've got to dig a little more, right? So what, what is consistently happening? rabbit trail, sorry. So you, you see this come into connection with the other areas like forgiveness, love, hope. We're going to talk about these more later, but just for an example, repentance. So repentance is in this area before God, this deep place, the spirit, the emotions. This is the place of repentance, our heart being rented open, our heart turning to Jesus, this place. But there's an emotional response that should be happening, right? There should be a remorse. There should be some things going on in our emotions. There should be some renewing in our mind. Our thinking should be changed to God's heart, to God's ways. Our behavior should be changing if there's true repentance, right? There should be fruit of repentance, behavior change in our lives, behavior transforming to the image and likeness of Jesus. There should be either new relationships formed in the community of faith or old relationships being transformed because we're not the same person. So where something has been like this, we're suddenly different. So there should be transformation in all these aspects. So the work of the Holy Spirit, um, the work of the Holy Spirit is superior to all of these other areas. You see this sort of in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. It's superior to our thinking. Paul really goes off on that. It's superior to our emotions, right? Don't let your emotions rule. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 19, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we are being saved. No, it is the very power of God. I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. This is where only God knows the thoughts. Only And, and so... It's a picture of this superiority of the Spirit, and our Spirit submitted to the Holy Spirit brings transformation to these other aspects of our lives, right? Okay, so we're going we're to buzz, buzz on through these. But prayer, waiting on the Lord, the gifts of the Spirit, worshiping together, that you're, you're going to sit down, we're just going to worship the Lord, we're just going to wait on the Lord. But I've got these questions, but I want to talk about this stuff. Well, we'll get to that. You know, it's, it's this change of pace to get into the Spirit. Number two, emotions, all, all over the place, right? Strong feelings, super powerful, bitterness. What do we affirm here? God created emotions. These are from him. They are a gift. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way. But this is, this is something that he longs to be in. He created emotions, and he ministers to emotions, right? So we provide care to address emotions, what does this look like? It does not mean that we condone every action of a person. And this is important. We're affirming, we're responding, we're attending, we're doing all these things. We're, we're, we're trying to step into empathy. It is very significant. We're listening to feel. We're trying to step into the other person's shoes. It doesn't mean that we condone their actions, but we recognize pain and we extend compassion. This is discipleship. Amen? We're listening to understand, we're recognizing, we're trying to feel, we're, we're trying to identify with that. Questions like, what, what were you feeling about that? What emotions were happening in your life? <clears throat> there's, there's a great tool, you can just Google emotional wheel. I wasn't sure I could get the rights to one this afternoon to put it on the screen. But where you can just have this wheel of all these connected emotions, different aspects of feeling, and, and use this as a tool to help people dig into their emotions, to process. What are you feeling? In some cases, it can be men and women. I'd say it's more common with men, but it can certainly happen with women as well. They have been formation has taken place in their life to such an extent that they don't even know how to identify a feeling. I, there are feelings there, but they have so squished that that if you're asking, what are you feeling? I'm not feeling anything. And, and they're, they're, they're telling the truth. They're not trying to lie to you. Again, 
There are emotions there, but they have so suppressed that, they have so pressed that down for so long that they're completely out of touch with that, and they're unaware. You may see the fruit of an emotion in your life, but they may not. They may think that they're truly just living 100% cognitively from, from their thinking, right? And so within that, there is value and journey to just finding and sharing an emotion, But this is important because, again, God created emotions. He ministers to emotions. So we want want to go there. We want to make space for that, even if it's uncomfortable for someone. Have them start to read the Psalms, look at the life of David. Lots of emotion. God, and this is a man after God's own heart. So this is is valuable. This is important to him. Emotions, I love how Dr. McMahon says this, emotions are much too powerful of a force in who we are and what we do to be ignored or overlooked. So we can't just assume that as we're discipling someone, the emotions are just all going to fall into place. This is, this is a force to be reckoned with, and we need to dig into it specifically. So, again, what is this with emotions, with brokenness, with woundedness, with bitterness, all these different aspects? There's some key steps that we want to keep in mind. We teach them here all the time. I'm not going to take any time on it all, but forgiveness, repentance, receiving God's forgiveness, forgiving ourselves, renouncing, breaking agreements with the enemy. You see a lot of strongholds, right? Right here in this area of emotions. Ephesians 4 talks about this. <clears throat> so renouncing the enemy, breaking agreements, and then receiving God's blessing, receiving his healing. So we're trying to help people identify destructive emotions and healthy emotions, godly emotions. We don't want to let our emotions rule, but God wants to heal us and bring us into a healthy emotional place. Uh, Ephesians 4.26, but don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge. But the Holy Holy Spirit produces This kind of fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. This is what we're wanting to to go after. And I believe it's Dallas Willard that that identified this, and you can tease it out in the Scriptures even more. But when when you find the fruit of the Spirit lacking, when you find... Then, then often you're, I would say probably always, behind that you're going to find two foundational pieces that are lacking, hope and faith. See, love and joy, if there isn't hope, they're not going to be produced. So we want to to dig in where, if you see there's no joy, if you see there's no peace, if you see there's no love, where is the break in hope? Where is it? Start start digging, pull on the string. Where's the hopelessness? Because that's going to start to bring, when there's hope restored in Christ, that's going to start to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Okay. When it comes to feelings, you, you always want to ask the question, maybe not out loud, but maybe, how are you coping with these emotions? How are you coping with these emotions? And often there's some attempt to control. So we we feel out of control or we feel stressed and we want to go and eat some yummy food. Or we feel this and we want to go and do a video game. Or we feel this and we want to go and then it can get into really, I mean, all these can be unhealthy, right? But pornography and so on and so forth. And we're, we're coping with feelings. So we want to, we want to look at coping We want to take people, I love how Dr. McMahon says this, the only true effective coping is in Christ. So we want to take people to coping in Christ, but we also are looking at what are they coping with and where do we need to restore hope so they're not having these crazy emotions all over the place that they're trying to cope with. So when you see how connected feeling and thinking and action are, you you see why it's so important that we look at all three of these areas. So number three is the thinking, the cognition. We've talked about this a lot, I feel like, in recent series, so I I don't want to spend a lot of time here. But we want to help people renew 
their minds to the Word of God, that we're thinking with the mind of Christ, that we're thinking with the mindset of heaven, soundtrack from heaven, right? And so we want to ask questions. We want to help them identify thought patterns that are inconsistent with what? With the Word, with the mind of Christ. <clears throat> Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, Romans 12, 2. This is going to position them to prove the will of God. So we're asking questions <clears throat> to understand. Um, we're asking questions, causing people to think. You, know, you can ask feeling questions, and people can get off into feelings and feeling, feeling. But when you ask cognitive thinking, like patterns, you see thought patterns, compare, priorities, listing, order, sequence, priorities, all these things require thinking. This isn't emotion at that point, this point. Then it's, it's taking people into a different aspect of who they are, into this place of thinking rather than just feeling. And this is where we approach things with reason and rationality. And this is a very important part of who we are. God values the mind. He wants our mind engaged. He doesn't want that shut off, right? <clears throat> so, there's a lot of, Dallas Willard goes into this, it's so interesting. There's a lot of destructive ideas and a lot of destructive images that are, that are sort of looping, if you were thinking of the soundtrack idea, in people's minds. And he gives, he gives the solution. This is just so, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That as the love of God begins to come in, it overpowers all of these destructive images and ideas that can control our lives when we're away from God. We can receive the love of God. This is why we talk so much about the love of God, because people, again, can talk the Christianese. Oh, I know that God loves me. I sang a little song, but it hasn't crept into and transformed every aspect of their lives because their spirit isn't crying out in all these different areas, Abba. So this is what we're going after is this revelation of the love of God sinking into every aspect of who we are. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing clearly the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we're placing the, Im the destructive images with the image of God. This is what's happening in our minds. Bringing the mind to dwell intelligently upon God. <laughs> so, This helps keep us from playing the hide-and-seek. What, what, is, what, is, what is it that we try to keep hidden? Why are we not wanting the love of God to come into these aspects of our lives? Well, because we don't want God to come into these aspects of our lives, because we don't want God to see. You know, the picture of the little kid, it's like, don't look. I'm going I'm to do something. I don't want you to see this. Even if you're standing right there, like, cover your eyes. You know, the, the, we do the same thing with God. And so aspects of our lives stay hidden. So we've got to find that shame. We've got to find those places. We've got to bring that out. It's, it's raw. It's vulnerable. But what's keeping that shame in place and keeping the love of God out is ultimately pride. So we've got to just start prying away at this. <clears throat> When we see transformed emotions, when we see transformed thinking, we're going to see transformed behavior, right? Matthew 12, 34, the second half there, whatever is in your heart determines what you say. So we see how the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaks. We see action, words flowing out, behavior flowing out of these other places, thoughts and, and feelings. <clears throat> So there is nothing about the ministry and teachings of Jesus that's just focused on knowledge. It's focused on transformation. It's focused on behavior. So we want to ask these questions very specifically about behavior. What is going on? What are you actually doing? Are you cussing these people out at work? What, you see what I'm saying? Uh, John 4, 34, John 15, you know, these are my friends. They do what I command. This is my command. You love one another. This is the doing, right? <clears throat> so we're facilitating a response 
to the direction and empowerment of God to produce life change. And, and the final place where you see this, you see this in the behavior, but you see it played out in this context. And, and taking a picture, trying to help someone even get a sense of their context. You know, there's exercises you can do where people look at their family tree, where they look at their family of origin. I mean, these things are just, this is the context you come out of. What's the context where you are right now? What are the people? What are the relationships? What are the things going on? What are the circumstances? What's going on? You know, it's like we're coming and <clears throat> we're trying to deal with some emotions or something, and, and someone's just like, well, hey, I'm homeless. There's something we need to be aware of in their context. They, it may be a difficult conversation to have with them about some of their thinking and some of their emotions and some of their behavior. It's like, I'm just trying to get my next meal and a roof over my head tonight. So we need to be aware of the context when we're discipling people. There can be physical things going on in their bodies. Now, is Jesus still the solution? Yes. Or the, are the thinking and the and the uh, emotions and, and, all, and all these behaviors, all these things, that could be connected to why they're homeless. It's, it's not, it may be connected, but we need to be aware of <laughs> they may have a different set of priorities. And we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the Lord in that place. <clears throat> what is their context? I environment is tremendous. When you look at homelessness so often... Over and over, and I don't know why I'm stuck on this as an example, but over and over, it, it's just things that have happened to many, many other people. They just didn't have a support system to take them through that. They were alone. They didn't have a family, or they didn't have a close family, or they didn't have, they, they didn't have close relationships. So this area of the context of relationships really cannot be overstated. Ecclesiastes 4 talks about this. Lots of times maybe we hear these scriptures at weddings, but it, it applies to more. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. I don't know where I would be without people that have helped me, you know? If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but if someone who falls alone is in real trouble... And, and this is where we see people's lives begin to completely unravel. So we need to see what are the key relationships? What are the connections? What is the support system? What are the people that you can be honest and real with? Or are there none in your life? These are, these are very important discipleship questions. Then here are these significant people in your life. What is their influence in your life? Right? This is where you have the folks who maybe they get saved or maybe they've been saved a long time and they, they're connecting with these friends and whenever they get together with these friends, they're falling into sin. What is their influence in your life? You know, the tragedy here is where I'll talk to people <clears throat> and they'll say, man, not just my, my closest friends, the people that I can just be the most real with, you know, none of them are believers. Ding, 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 ding. There's like alarm bells going off, right? But this is the situation that so many people find themselves in because they feel that they have to be fake around believers, but they can be real about the non-believers. They don't feel shame there. They feel shame with you. So this is where this, this discipling relationship and this affirmation, this empathy, and this understanding, this care, the love of Jesus, somehow Jesus was able to hang out with sinners, and they didn't feel ashamed. They felt convicted, and their lives were transformed. That's a humongous difference. Shame pushes you down and keeps you trapped. Conviction, repentance, transformation. So we've got to be a source of that love and that compassion and that empathy and that transformative power of God rather than the voice of beaten down shame, so people can be real. Amen? So, physical bodies, are people caring? The body is the temple. Are people caring for their physical body? This seems like a strange thing for discipleship, but Jesus died on the cross in a bodily form for your bodily resurrection. He's very concerned about your body. He says, your body, he says, you know, I was dwelling on the earth in this place called a temple. It's beautiful, gold, this amazing place. And now 
that is over, torn the veil, and I've chosen to be in a temple that is called your body. Like there's, there's great value, something we need to be taken care of. So this is an aspect of discipleship. Are you honoring God with your body? We're not just talking about sexual purity here. We're talking about what are you eating? We're talking about are you exercising? We're talking about all of these aspects of life. Are you eating something green? Other than green apple Jolly Ranchers. Is there, is there, so, so all of these aspects are so important. <clears throat> the key relationships, the relational support system, and that we're, we're pressing in to these questions, not just, oh, how's your marriage doing? Oh, my marriage is great. No, how are you investing in your marriage? How are you investing in your spouse? The financial context, what, what's going on in this area? Is this area surrendered to the lordship and reign of Jesus? You know, finances can be one of the last ones to go, right? <clears throat> Are you giving? All these different aspects. There is a road map for how I think we typically think about transformation happening in people's lives. And, and it's helpful you know, I think we think of God doing a transformational work. They encounter the Word. They encounter the truth. They respond to that. They repent. There's something deep within them that, that changes. Their, their heart, their passions are changed. We want to see people's passions changed. In, in the area of emotions, it's not just that we want to submit our emotions to God. It's not just we want to control our emotions. and All, all that is true, but we believe that the Holy Spirit can come in and sanctify emotions and actually produce desires for love, desires for godliness in people's lives. We believe this, right? This is, this is why we're hanging out. So, so it makes sense for it to be like, oh, there's an encounter with the Word, and then there's, there's transformation desires, and then there's action. And that progression is helpful. I, I'm not trying to say this not, but I, I would propose to you at the same time in discipleship, we need to be led of the Spirit. We need to be asking, what is God doing? Because you may be ministering to disciples. You are not, really not even sure if they're saved, and the Holy Spirit is leading you to invite them to go on a missions trip somewhere and minister to people who are hurting and underprivileged and struggling. And you're like, but God, I don't know if they have those desires. God, I don't know if they even really have a personal relationship with you. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm concerned. But it's like, oh, well, you know what? Let's take them. Let's go do ministry. Let's go love people. Let's go wash some feet. Let's go give away some shoes. Let's go give away some food. I have literally taken people on mission trips and seen them get saved, serving on a missions trip. Glory to God. Now, does that fit perfectly in our, in our no be do, in our, in our, well, there was transformation, and there was a heart transformation, and then there was desire? No. no. I mean, in many of these cases, I wonder why these people even went. But they went. Something within them, what did we affirm? The work of God. If someone wants to go and do ministry and do a mission trip and they don't even know Jesus, that's God working. That's like miraculous. That's incredible. Unless there was a hot member of the opposite sex or something they thought was going. Like, why are they doing it? So they're, they're going and God's meeting them in their doing, changing their passions, renewing their mind, and bringing salvation into life. So I just, I want to be sure that you see, you know, there's, there's the neat, tidy progression and how these things tie together that we put together. But God just loves to blow up our boxes. He does things in all kinds of crazy ways. You see it in His Word. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in ministry. So this is why we're asking, what is God doing? God's calling them to go on a missions trip. Well, let's, let's go. Let's go see what God's going to do. It's going to be wild. Amen? We're going to pray. We're going to wrap this up. As we close in prayer, I want you to ask the Lord. It may be something even pinged 
as we were talking about this, but just ask the Lord, Lord, is there something in one of these areas? Where are you working slash want to work in my life right now? Because I can pretty much guarantee you it's, it's, it's in one of these areas. Is there something in that deep place of the assumptive that needs to be tweaked where my will needs to be brought in alignment where, <clears throat> where there's still just some, some pre-thought from some old places and it needs to, needs to change. What's going on with my emotions? Is there anger? Is there a foothold of the enemy somewhere in my emotions? Is there, is there a point of hopelessness that's producing some of this bad fruit, lack of fruit? Is there love? Is there joy? Is there peace? What's going on in my thinking? Is my mind renewed? Or am I stuck in some of that stinking thinking? Is my, is my mind reflecting the mind of Christ? Or is it going to these other places? Is my mind positioned to prove the will of God? What's going on in my behavior? If someone truly sat and quizzed me, would they find evidence that I am a good Christian in something other than a few minutes a day? Would they see evidence in my behavior of the image and life of Jesus? What's going on in my relationships, in my context? Am I seeing God at work? Am I feeling like I'm a victim? Am I walking through these situations as in the victory of Jesus? Am I carrying hope into these relationships? Am I, am I looking for what you're teaching me in difficult contexts and difficult situations? Holy Spirit, we just surrender afresh to you. We invite your rule and reign in all of these areas of our lives. We want you to produce the character of Jesus, the emotions of Jesus, the thinking of Jesus, the behavior of Jesus, because we want every aspect of our context to be transformed by your goodness. Father, I just pray that you raise up every person in this room to go and obey your word and make disciples, to go and ask some uncomfortable questions and pry into these different aspects of life, to go and to celebrate what they see you doing and your value in people around them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your week. If you want prayer about anything, 